Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today I would like to talk about Chinese dynasties. Now, in order to do that, we shall examine the Chinese historiographical tradition. Let's get to it. Often as we imagine ancient China, we tend to imagine a unified country governed by a dynasty, or at least a dynasty at a time. Now, such view would be erroneous, because there were some short periods of time where China was not unified, it was divided into different regions, and each region would be governed by a different group. Now, to understand and fully comprehend and study Chinese history and all the dynasties in details, it would take me probably over three hours, and I think that that video would be rather too long. So for this video, I have decided that we will have a more superficial, overall, general idea of all the dynasties. So this video will be a kind of a preparatory video to create a solid basis for your understanding of Chinese history. And then I will have specified and detailed videos, one video per dynasty. So this video should be considered as an introductory level video, but before we start discussing all these dynasties, I would like to say a couple of things. One has to do with my choice of content, and the second one has to do with linguistics, or should we say, with Chinese as a language. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is that in this video, as I've said, I don't have time to discuss the, all the things that happened and all the battles and all the wars. We will have dedicated videos to these. And actually, in the comments below, please let me know if there is any specific battle that you want me to talk about. I will gladly make a video about that. Uh, however, for these, I will just discuss about the most salient achievements of each of these dynasties. Now, the linguistic part, the, the, the part that has to do with Mandarin Chinese, that's the kind of Chinese that I'm going to use in this video, um, has to do with the names of the dynasties. Now, these names are clearly in Chinese, so we will discuss their meanings. I will show the uh, ideograms or the actual characters used to write these, uh, these words, these uh, names of the, of the dynasties. But uh, we will also discuss the proper pronunciation or pitch, because you need to remember that Chinese as a language is a tonal language, meaning that it's a language which has different tones or pitches. Now, changing even slightly uh, the tone, even a very small modification to the pronunciation, will end up, will result in a completely different word. So I will give you a little bit of, of background on this, but it's very important that you pronounce these names properly in Chinese, with the proper pitches. So, the same syllable, the same word, can be pronounced in four different ways. Namely, this one here, we can say ma, 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 ma. So these are the four tones. Same syllable, four completely different meanings. Let's get started. All right, so the first dynasty officially, or what we're talking about traditional Chinese history, is the is this dynasty here. It is pronounced Xia. So, uh, considering that the word Chao means dynasty in Chinese, we will say it as we will refer to it as Xia Chao, Xia Chao. Now, this dynasty here is an interesting dynasty because the fact is that we don't have any actual evidence for its existence. So, this is, again, traditionally speaking, the first dynasty, but the one that follows it will be the actual first dynasty that we have evidence for. It was supposedly founded by uh, Yu the Great, so in Chinese, Da Yu, who was a legendary ruler of ancient China, who was famed for his introduction of flood control. The following dynasty is the Shang Chao, Shang Chao, Please notice that the G is not pronounced in Chinese when it follows an N. This is the dynasty that supposedly took over the Xia Chao and ruled in the Yellow River Valley in the second millennium before Christ. Now, as far as the dates are concerned, we're talking about 1766 to 1122 BC. Now, the Shang Chao and many of the events that occurred during this dynasty are mentioned in various Chinese classics. One of the characteristics of the Shang is the royal tombs. Bronze working is one of the features of this, uh, of this dynasty, and also because bronze weapons uh, were an integral part of Shang society. 
Now, as far as the Shang infantry is concerned, some of the weapons that they were using, we have the Mao, or spears, the Yue, or pole axes, the Ge, or pole-based dagger axes, bows, and as far as the armour are concerned, we do see both leather and bronze, bronze helmets. The next one in line is the Zhou, Zhou Chao, Zhou Chao. Now the Zhou dynasty is furthermore divided into Western Zhou or Xi Zhou and Eastern Zhou or Dong Zhou. Now as far as the dates are concerned, the Western Zhou dynasty we are talking about 1046 to 771 BC and it began with this king here, King Wu Wang from Zhou. So you normally say Zhou Wu Wang. It's interesting because actually the word Wang mean, means king and it's one of the most common surnames in China. So what basically happened is that when the Shang dynasty collapsed, the um, former lands were divided into hereditary fiefs. There are a lot of kings during this uh, dynasty. So what I'd say is as long as you remember the first king and then you just remember that there were a lot of kings, you already have an overall idea Then perhaps in a dedicated video we will talk and discuss about all the kings. These Zhou kings derived most of their income from royal lands. Now as we move to the Eastern Zhou, so the king maintains his, in, his ritual importance, but their authority over the land starts to diminish. But one very important factor that we need to remember about the Eastern Zhou is the golden age of Chinese philosophy, the hundred schools of thought which flourished during this period. At the very end of the Zhou dynasty, things start to get interesting because we have what's called in Chinese the Chun Qiu, which, is, which translated into English would mean spring and autumn period. To add the word period, which, is, which in Chinese is Shi Dai, we have Chun Qiu Shi Dai. So as the dates are concerned, 771 to 476. Now, as the Zhou lose power, the Yellow River drainage basin was divided, and we have hundreds of small states, some of which are actual single cities, so similar to Greek uh, city-states. Zhang Guo Shi Dai, the period of the Warring States. This is very famous, and it's the era that followed the spring and autumn period. So during this period, the dukes of the preceding period become kings, and we have many battles, wars for hegemony and power. But if we have a look at the culture and society, we have nobles, bureaucrats, reformers, sophisticated arithmetics, literature and economic developments. Now finally, it is time for one of the most famous Chinese dynasties, the Qin. Qin. Here we have the foundation of the first empire. So we are not talking about kings anymore, we are talking about the emperor. So Qin Chao was the first imperial dynasty of ancient China. As far as the dates are concerned, 221 to 206 BC. Now the Qin sought to create an imperial state unified by highly structured political power and stable economy. One of the main characteristics that I would like you to remember possibly is the large military support that they had. The role of aristocrats start to be minimized and the empire has direct administrative control over the peasantry. And please consider the peasants comprise the overwhelming majority of the population at that time. They were the basis of the labor force. Now, if one had to forget everything about the Qin, the one thing you would have to remember is the construction of the wall, the Chinese wall in the northern border. I think you all know about the Great Wall of China, which in Chinese is called the Changcheng, or Long Wall, literally. The name of the first emperor of China, of the Qin dynasty, is the famous Qin Shi Huangdi. Now, there are a lot of things that we could say about this emperor, but the one thing I will say that I think you all know the city-sized mausoleum, guarded by the life-sized terracotta army. That was his tomb. The second imperial dynasty is the Han Chao. Han Chao. Now, this empire or imperial dynasty spanned for over four centuries, so it lasted longer than the Qin Chao, and it is considered the Golden Age in Chinese history. So this is one thing that you should remember about the Han Chao, is that it's considered the golden age in Chinese history. Even today, China's majority ethnic group, 
refers to itself as Han people, and even the Chinese characters in Chinese are called Hanzi, which means the characters of the Han. So at the very top of Han society we have the emperor, who was presiding over the government, but in this case he would share power with both nobility and appointed ministers, who were coming directly from the gentry class. So we have an age of economic prosperity, institutional innovations, and the settlement of newly conquered frontiers territories. And one very small thing we have to say before moving to the next period is that in, in the Han period we have the Western Han period, then we have a very small dynasty in between called the Xin Chao, but it's so small because basically it, it lasted only from 9 to 23 AD. So it kind of interrupted the Han dynasty because after it then we have the Eastern Han uh, period. So the vast majority of this period of time was under Han control with only this very small exception. Next in line, the th period of the Three Kingdoms, the Sangguo. So what basically happens is a tripartite division of China. Now it is interesting that uh, we translate it as Three Kingdoms because the fact is that each of these states was eventually headed not by a king but by an emperor. And all of them considered to be the legitimate successor of the Han dynasty. So as far as the dates are concerned, we're talking about 220 AD to 280 AD. One thing I'd like you to remember about this is that the Three Kingdom period is one of the bloodiest in Chinese history. Some historians even consider it to be the second deadliest period of warfare in history behind World War II. Now, as the Three Kingdoms period finishes, we have a new dynasty again. So we have the we have the Jin Chao or the Jin dynasty, which divides into Xi Jin or Western Jin, Jin and Dong Jin or Eastern Jin. Now, one of the characteristics of this dynasty is the production of um, greenish porcelain wares and the quality thereof. And jar designs often incorporated animal as well as Buddhist figures. Western Jin dynasty provided a short period of peace and stability, which was followed by a devastating civil war, called the War of the Eight Princes. Also, you have to consider that in the same time, North China was ruled by 16 kingdoms. So, although this one contributed to an even greater period of instability, we have to consider that during this period, huge numbers of people moved south, particularly during the Eastern Jin, uh, 16 kingdoms so-called. A lot of people, a huge number of people moved south from the central plain, stimulating the development of southern China. Now, after the fall of the Jin Chao, we moved to the southern and northern dynasties, the Nanbei Chao. For the dates, we're talking about 420 to 589 AD. Now, this was an age of political chaos and civil war, but it was also a time of flourishing of art and culture, and also advancement in technology. Now, during the Jin dynasty, we have the invention of the stirrup. Now, during this period here instead, we have the development of heavy cavalry. We have other advances in medicine, astronomy, mathematics, and cartography. It is now the time of the Sui, Sui Chao, Sui Chao. Now, if you have to remember, one thing about this is the fact that it was a short-lived imperial dynasty. But regardless of the fact that it was short-lived, because we're talking about 581 to 618, it was a dynasty of pivotal significance. China is finally reunited, reunified, after three centuries of north-south-south division. Now, this is also the time of some costly and disastrous military campaigns against Korea, or some Korean kingdoms, should we say. The end of this dynasty was the revolt, which culminated in the assassination of the emperor by the hands of his ministers in 618. So, considering the fact that Buddhism created a unifying cultural force that uplifted people, we could say that Buddhism was responsible for the rebirth of culture in China under the Sui Chao. The next dynasty is a very, very important dynasty. It's very difficult to keep it short, but I'll try to do that. It is the Tang, Tang Chao, Tang Chao. Now, this dynasty was founded by the family called Li, Li. Now, what this family was trying to do, they were trying to gain as much power as possible taking advantage of the decline of the Sui Empire. Now, some of the high points of this civilization is golden age of cosmopolitan culture and military campaigns, which acquired a lot of new territories. 
During the 7th and 8th centuries, the population registered was about 50 million. This is a period of progress and stability. We have the development of woodblock printing, and Buddhism became the, a major influence in Chinese culture. Although when we talk about Buddhism during the Tang Chao, we have to consider they did gain a lot of influence in Chinese culture, will end up being persecuted by the state. So kind of a contrasting situation there. Now after the Tang Dynasty, we have two periods that I will only give you the dates here and mention, but I will not talk about it because I want to move to the next dynasty. But, the, but they need to be mentioned. So the first one is the Five Dynasty and Ten Kingdoms and the Kingdom of Dali. Then the next dynasty in line is the Song Dynasty, which is divided in Northern Song or Bei Song and Southern Song or Nan Song. The Song Dynasty began in 960 and continued until 1279. So when you try to imagine China during what were the, Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages in Europe, then we are talking about the Song Dynasty. This was the first government in world history to issue banknotes or actual paper money nationally. We have the first known use of gunpowder and, also very important, the first discernment of true north using a compass. Differently from previous dynasties, the Song dynasty does not have control over the um, birthplace of Chinese civilization, which was the Yellow River. But the Song Empire contained 60% of China's population and the majority of most production agricultural land. We then move to the Da Liao, literally Great Liao, which is the next dynasty in line, which begins in 907 and terminates in 1125. So this is one of the dynasties that is stationed in northern China, because please consider that China is now not unified. As a matter of fact, this dynasty was founded around the time of the collapse of Tang China, and it was the first state to control all of Manchuria. Now initially, the Song dynasty and the Liao dynasty had some good relationship, but these started to deteriorate because the Song dynasty was constantly trying to create military alliances with other groups. And this would lead to great battles like the Battle of the Gaoliang River. Jin dynasty is an interesting one, Jin Chao, Jin meaning gold in Chinese, 1115 to 1234. Now this is the last dynasty before Mongolian rule. So 1234 is the date when the Mongols overthrew and destroyed this dynasty. So Jin Chao was created in what would become northern Manchuria in 1115. Now after taking over northern China, the Jin became incre increasingly sinicized. But it is towards the early 13th century that the Jin Chao begins to feel the pressure of Mongols from the north. And we're talking about Genghis Khan. It is in 1211, as a matter of fact, the 50,000 Mongols on horses invaded the Jin Empire and began absorbing. And although the Jin army had half a million men with 150,000 cavalry, they abandoned the western capital. The following year, the Mongols went north, looting the Jin eastern capital and besieging the central capital. Now, just before talking about the uh, actual Mongols, I'd like to mention the western state of Xia, which is a state that existed between 1038 and 1227 and suffered from devastating destructions by the Mongols, unfortunately including most of its written records and architecture. So we don't have a lot of information about this state and this is why I'm not going to talk about it much. So this map here that you can see will show all three again, so you can have an idea so about the Liao and the Song, we do have quite a bit of information, but about this state here, unfortunately, much is controversial. Officially, the Great Yuan, or Yuan Chao, or Da Yuan, this was the Mongolian Empire, established by Kublai Khan. Now, the Mongols had been ruling territories in, in northern China for decades, but it was not until 1271 that Kublai Khan officially proclaimed the dynasty in the traditional Chinese style. This was again a unified time for China, as his realm controlled most of modern-day China, including Korea, and clearly modern-day Mongolia. What is remarkable to say about the Yuan Chao is that it was the first foreign dynasty to rule all of China. As far as the dates are concerned, we have 1271 until 1368. 
Now, what's interesting about this uh, dynasty is that it's it has a kind of a double face because it's considered as the successor of the Mongol Empire, but also an imperial Chinese dynasty. Clearly, the Mongols need a video for themselves, but I've already made one video about Mongolian at least war strategies and a little bit about their origins, so you can find that on my channel. I will leave a link here. So if you're interested and you want to know more details about the Mongols, please click the link below. Let's continue. The following is my favorite dynasty, and it's the Ming Chao or Ming Dynasty. Please consider that this character means bright. It's a dynasty that lasted for 276 years, from 1368 to 1644, and it followed the collapse of, of the Mongolian dynasty. The era of the Ming is one of the greatest eras of orderly government and social stability in human history. Another very important point to say about the Ming dynasty, it was the dynasty that came after the Mongols and it was the last dynasty in China ruled by the ethnic Han or the Chinese. One thing that needs to be kept in mind and which is very important is the fact that the Portuguese first established trade with China in 1516, so we're talking about the Ming dynasty already, and the forbidden city in uh, Beijing or in Peking is the official imperial household of, of both the Ming dynasty and the following dynasty which is the Qing from 1420 until 1924 and eunuchs during the Ming dynasty gained unprecedented power over state affairs. For those of you who don't know what a eunuch is it's basically a castrated man because eunuchs were the only males allowed inside the queen's inner chamber. Literature, painting, poetry, music and Chinese opera of various types flourished during this dynasty. So as the religion is concerned, during Ming dynasty or Ming Chao, we have the dominant religious beliefs were those of the three teachings, meaning Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism. The last dynasty is the Qing dynasty or Qing Chao, the character Qing meaning pure. This is a Manchu dynasty and it ruled from 1644 to 1912. It was preceded by the Ming dynasty and succeeded by the Republic of China. Now this empire was a multicultural empire which lasted almost three centuries and the modern Chinese state's territorial base was formed during this empire. During Qing Chao we, the population rose to 400 million but the economical situation was not stable at all, considering that government revenues were fixed at a very low rate, virtually guaranteeing eventual fiscal crisis. We have corruption, rebels tested government legitimacy, and it is during the Qing dynasty that we have the Opium Wars, fought between the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and the Empire. Now, it being very long, because again we say three centuries, we also have fiscal and administrative reforms, including elections and new legal code, which do characterize this empire. All right then, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching and thank you for your time as always. If you like this video, please remember, thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. Zai Jian.